Welcome back. So today we will have a presentation of Andre, and uh, we will st we will have a one hour presentation roughly, and then we will have Q and A, and then we finish the day of today, and then we gather tomorrow at one forty five for the last section of Berk. So the procedure works like uh, like uh, yesterday. Uh, I just have Andre pay attention that we see. Yeah, thank you. Um, the procedure is like yesterday. So if you have question, you can just put in the Q and A section uh, panel that you see on the bottom of your Zoom application. But you can also raise hand. And here I have a question for Andre. It's fine if people interrupt you, or uh, uh, do you want? Uh, uh, do yeah. you want to? I prefer to. to... No, it, it's it's fine to interrupt me, but I don't. I have only one screen here. I won't see your Q and A immediately. So, yeah, you can, yeah, oh. yeah. It clo it hides like half the presentation, I guess. Okay, okay. So, uh, you will make maybe it's easy if you make some question. Uh, we see this chat now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If uh, you make break, and then I can see if there is a raise hand. We do like this. It's okay. Ah, yes. So, yeah, I'll so I don't have explicit sections, but I will then try to. Yeah, otherwise, I interrupt you. you. It's fine if I interrupt you? Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, that we go like this. So, you can use the QA button to type your question, or you can erase your end. And when I see that our question, I will interrupt and raise so the question can be taken on fly when while we are going on. And uh, so I also put uh, in the chat now to everybody the link to the presentation of Andre. And uh, so I would like to say some few words about Andre, and then I we, we will start. So Andre is working currently into the Royal in the Royal Institute of Technology in the Applied Physics Department. And uh, difference from the speaker of yesterday, he started to work on Gromax very recently, I think. It's uh, in 2020 as a postdoc. And, uh, and his was, work was mainly on SQL GPU backend. And uh, he was also ensuring working on performance and portability across different GPU architecture, like mainly Intel and AMD. And uh, it's very active in the in uh, GitLab, as you might see, and if you have look at uh, Gromax GitLab, so it's contributing to all aspects of the Gromax development. And uh, it's uh, one thing that is very proud is that he makes possible for the user to use uh, Gromax on Dardell and Lumi. Dardell and Lumi are two supercomputers that are located in Europe, one in Stockholm and one in Finland. And they have all IMD uh, platforms, I would say, architecture. And uh, now I'm very curious to look, to listen to his uh, testing and testing infrastructure. Yeah, please, Andre. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction, Lissandra. So, yeah, uh, there were already some questions raised yesterday about testing. So, hopefully, we'll clarify a bit more about how engineering testing in Gromox works, testing. Uh, in quite general sense, because what is testing? Because let's start with the definition. And while there's like no single specific definition, I uh, over there I mean, you can use vocabulary, but yeah. uh, there's not not as a sort of an engineering term. But in very very basic uh, terms. Testing is a process of checking that something does what it is intended to do. So anything is that falls into this very broad definition can be called testing. And that's why we have many different kinds of tests, approaches to testing in a way. There are unit tests where we test small individual isolated parts of the program. So you have a function that computes a square root, and you check that, yeah, it indeed computes a square root. Uh, we have integration tests, where we test the uh, interaction of different modules, the program as a whole. So yeah, if you have Chromax, you test 
as integration test that it can run the whole microdynamics loop. So like it can load the file, compute force, output energies, and it all works in tandem. That's fine. There are functional tests. Again, we find the final output of the pro application. I would say in this case, it is in the checking the trajectory or even the uh, more microscopic quantities like pre-energy difference for some protocol. There are end-to-end -end tests. Again, it's even more higher level. It's probably it's installation or, yeah, again, test, testing some protocols. It, test protocols probably is in somewhat in between functional tests and end-to-end -end tests. It's not hard uh, delineation between different types. Uh, there are also acceptance testing, entire application for end goals, with end goals, again, being very vague category. Usually acceptance testing is present uh, in more commercial software development where you have a specific set of requirements, like this program must conform to this standard or must process this many requests per second. So that's probably a bit harder very often in academic context to have such a hard goals to have well-defined acceptance testing. Uh, but for example, physical validation tests that we have in Gromax probably falls into this category because the basic requirements for the Gromax for, for any MD application to be basically acceptable as a scientific tool is that well the physics work it doesn't produce total uh, garbage in general it, it, it conforms to physics not that each individual function works or it can output like energy, but physics is correct. Uh, there is also very important for Gromox performance testing that we check that it's not only correct, but it is fast enough. MD is very computationally intensive. It's not uncommon to run many nodes for many days, so performance is critical. And also there is smoke testing, Basically, if it, I turn it on, does it emit magic smoke out of it? Uh, is it totally broken or not? Which is, unfortunately, is the situation we have with some of the analysis tools that don't have any good test coverage. So it just, yeah, it, it works. It's not totally broken, it produces something. Yeah, that's, unfortunately, yeah, that's partially what we have in some places. And again, it's just like one way to categorize different kinds of testing. It's up, up in the application to software development. If, if you work in robotics, probably there are uh, very different examples or embedded programming, whatever. Uh, another concept to know when talking about testing and especially testing infrastructure is uh, CI and CD. CI continuous integration is uh, a practice of very often, classically several times a day, in practice it depends, uh, merging individual work, work on the features into the shared code base. So it's not that each developer works on their own copy of the code and right before the major release, everybody pushes it all into the repository and tries to solve the merge conflicts. It's working in small bits, merging frequently, and trying to work on the shared code base with minimal divergence. Any divergence, any uh, changes in the code should be merged in as soon as possible. And the uh, CD is uh, uh, an, a counterpart to CI, is that it's uh, in general shortening the software cycle and also having uh, automated testing which enable both having shorter cycle and also having the CI practice of very frequent merges. Because if you if every change to the code base needs extensive manual testing, you cannot just do free, free frequent merges or you will have your main code base constantly broken. Neither is particularly good. And uh, these two practices, they usually go together CI-CD, solve many problems. I said it reduces the 
friction between different teams because if you're both working on the same file and you do uh, same modifications, if it's small modifications that's weakly merged, yeah, you, you never have much divergence. But if uh, two developers worked on the same file for half a year and then decide to merge their changes, chances are it will require at least another half a year to resolve things, so all the things and to uh, get the two versions work together correctly. It reduces the need for manual testing, which is not only resource intensive as in takes developers time to run the test, but it also allows to run much more comprehensive and understandable testing and have good overview of which configurations are tested and not, uh, I think Joe tested, I think two months ago on this, this feature, this architecture. No, we clearly know what is tested on what hardware is tested. And yeah, we still do want some manual tests in some cases, but the less we do it, the better. And also it avoids the situation, especially when working with critical when working with external contributors, but also quite often in academia when PhD student leaves that somebody contributes a feature or starts contributing feature and then yeah, their PhD is defended or their external contributors just move on to work on a different project. And uh, there is this feature introduced or even work done in the fork of the code and uh, nobody else knows what to do because it's yeah, just totally different version of the code. It's not integrated into the main branch. Nobody quite knows what it does. We probably it's not covered by tests. So yeah, uh, probably a lot of work will get wasted this way. In case of Gromax, uh, yeah, several times a day, it's probably too optimistic and uh, compared to many, say, web applications, I wouldn't say our recycle is short. We make a, very, a new major release every year, not many times per day as sometimes happens for smaller projects. But still, it is a relatively short release cycle, I would say, compared to some other scientific uh, codes. And uh, we still do some, I'd say a lot of manual testing because yeah, in some cases we just couldn't, uh, didn't have time to automate some parts of it. And sometimes it's just very hard to do. And uh, yeah, you don't really want to run a full multi-node free energy workflow for every small change. So yeah, this is quite hard to automate and doesn't always make sense to automate if uh, the test is so expensive that you anyway run it probably once per release cycle just before the release to make sure it's correct. So CI, continuous integration. And uh, in particular, continuous testing that enables the continuous integration. If you have opened a merge request or looked at a merge request, you probably noticed this part here, or probably it has a red cross somewhere. This is a battery of tests that we run for each commit in each merge request before you are allowed to merge your code into the main or release branch of Gromax. We need, uh, you need all these tests to pass. You have, need to have the pipeline uh, passing. Uh, you also need two approvals, but that was covered by Sebastian yesterday. And if you click on this uh, pipeline ID, you get a full list of jobs. And you have several stages here, pre-build, configure, build, test, documentation, source check, and post test, doing a bunch of different things. Uh, in pre-build, we check just very basic things. We check that the code is formatted according to our guidelines. We check the 
copyright headers are present and we do very simple basic build and test run. In configure build, we run CMake for different configurations, like we use GPU without GPU, we use MPI without MPI, double precision, GCC, Clang, like all debug build, release build, not all possible combinations of all of those, but we try to have some representative set. Then we, in the next stage, we build all these configurations and then we run the unit and regression tests there. Our unit tests, what we call unit tests in Gromax is somewhat misleading because some of those are probably better called integration tests. It's just imperfect historical nomenclature. It's probably won't fall in. Not all of them will fall into the strict definition of unit tests that we have, but that's how this part of code is called. Then we check that we can build the documentation that's uh, bundled with the code. We run some static analysis checks, clank tidy, discussed yesterday. And then we check that the web page contains the manual and release notes and all that can also be built. The first stage, code style, we use clank format to enforce the consistent formatting of the source code. So we don't want to argue where to put this brace or do we need space here, do we need space there? Yeah, we, we, we just have the consistent formatting sense to Clang format. Uh, but since Clang format is very sensitive to the exact version and different versions of Clang format produce slightly different formatting and obviously if it's produced with different version formatted differently, it won't pass the CI. You need to have this exact version. It is kind of dated, but in Ubuntu 2 or 4, it can be installed like this. And in Ubuntu 24 or 4, you need to use pip x to install this or this uh, specific version. If you're touching the Python code, you need to install black formatter, also quite popular tool. And also we have a script to check copyrights that yeah, unless you're creating new files, you probably don't need to worry too much. You just keep this header there at the top of, of the file and don't touch it. Uh, Soon-ish, we plan to upgrade to a newer version of Clank format, but the day is not today. And uh, if you have any troubles installing Clank format on your machine, and I don't know, you have Windows, and I don't know, you, you can install Clank format on Windows, but probably it's hard or something. Uh, our CI is quite helpful because you can go to the, click the link on the failed job. You see the Clank format job here has failed. You can just click on it and it will output the log file and it contains the patch that can be applied to your code to reformat it according to the format's configuration. Or you can download the archive and the patch file is there for you to use. That said, I personally suggest that Clank format is relatively easy to install and you should get it locally and probably install it as git pre-commit hook. Uh, we have it in our developer documentation exact steps how to do that. It's like one or two shell comments. Then the next stage in our testing is configure, build, and test. Well, the next three stages. First, just run CMake. The second run makes. The third, the third run make check. And again, it has different compilers, different MPI settings, different GPU settings, different versions of GPU framework. And we also do some tests with sanitizers, like address sanitizer, thread sanitizer, a different behavior sanitizer. If you're not familiar what sanitizers are, those are special ways to build your program with extra checks. So that, for example, it, it runs very slow, but it uh, can detect, uh, say, out of bound access to an array, which in normal build might 
just fly under the radar. You just read some garbage value or for the reason uninitialized value. It's not illegal in C++ to read uninitialized value. You just get some something random. And it might just happen that this random value is often zero because, for example, it often falls into the memory that was previously freed and zeroed. Uh, so you might be quite lucky with normal tests that it passes, but still it, the code is incorrect because on another machine, for example, with slightly faster, slower CPU or something, this exact circumstances won't happen and your code will crash. But static sanitizer, uh, address sanitizer will add checks on every array access that will detect such illegal behavior and print a nice-ish warning saying that, okay, in this line of code, you're doing bad things, don't do bad things. Uh, we also run tests for each configuration in two different jobs. One uses a new test framework, unit test framework, as you call it, and the other uh, runs the old deprecated uh, regression test framework that Mark talked yesterday, the one using Perl scripts that we tried to deprecate, but it's not with high priority, so it's quite slowly moving. We also have a few jobs specific to our Python API. Unless you work on that part of code, you should not worry about that, but just be aware that yeah, there are a couple jobs that in this thing. So here, configure, build, and test jobs. JMX API, regression test run for client 9 configuration, unit test run for client 9 configuration, unit test run for client 13 with MPI, unit test with address sanitizer. And then we have documentation, source check, and post test. Documentation and web page, usually not something you need to worry about unless you make changes there. And uh, here you can just go to the web page build job description, click on browse or download, and you can download the PDF and HTML file. You can definitely build the documentation yourself locally, but uh, it is, especially for one time or infrequent contributors, it may take more time just to set up the necessary version of Doxygen and all that stuff and understand how it is built. It is a bit too convoluted to my taste. So in this case, if you're changing the web page, it's a quick way to check that it is indeed renders this time correctly. If you enter new equation, you can see that it is displayed right. Andre. And the source check. Andre, yes. there is a question. Uh, mm -hmm. We are supposed to use 11.1.0 uh, or 11.0.1 Clang format. So it's a question on, on the Clang format. Yes. I mean, it, uh, okay, I guess it is typo 11.0.1, but yeah. I will double check and update the slides. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Ah, okay. So you think uh, it's okay? Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I have a typo. Well, yeah. Here, I think that is uh, the right one, but uh, yeah, I will update slides to make sure. Yeah. yeah I, I think that's this one. But yeah, oh, since yeah. I, I might yeah. be mistaken, I don't have it. Yeah. Heart. Yeah. Since I interrupt you, I just ask one to say if there is anybody else that has a question, please raise your hand since I already interrupt Andre. Mm -hmm. mm, no, I don't see any hand coming up. Okay, mm -hmm. you can go on, Andre. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, and the source check stage in the pipeline. It has two jobs. One is check source that verifies that every function that needs documentation is documented. Because yeah, one thing is that you can build the documentation. You have this nice Doxygen web page. The other is that everything is documented. It's like two different parts of it. And check source enforces that everything that needs documentation needs documentation has it. And Clang tidy is uh, another tool from LVM 
uh, that add some additional checks uh, for the source code. For example, this code is correct C++. It's perfectly fine to check, to, to write code like this. It will compile because yeah, it, it is valid C++, but it is suspicious. It's quite weird to have the same variable equal to both one and two at the same time. So perhaps there was some typo here. So it's not incorrect code, it is suspicious code. And that's what Clang tidy basically checks. It also checks sometimes that you might have common things done inefficiently or just in non-modern way. So that's things that are not strictly incorrect, but are fishy. In addition to the tests run on every commit in every merge request, we also have a bunch of other uh, test harnesses we run. Uh, one is post-merge test after your code is merged, right after. We run uh, a few other tests similar to how we run the normal pipelines, just yeah, after the merge. That runs, for example, multi-GPU tests, uh, uh, MPI tests, like some less common configurations. Just because, yeah, reserving uh, two GPUs for like 10 minutes for every single commit that's perhaps reformatting the documentation. That's, yeah, we don't have that many resources here. So that's wasteful, but it's still very important. It still allows us to catch any breakage, any breaking change uh, quite soon. Okay, the code got merged into main, but we still immediately notify the author and not half a year later when we do some acceptance testing. We also have nightly tests on some, not really exotic, but uh, the more uncommon hardware that we don't have in our CI. For example, we have like one machine with uh, some AMD GPUs and it, because it's one only one machine, we don't want to put it in our pipeline. So if it goes down because the, the power supply died, we don't have all our development stopped, but we still want to make sure the code runs there. So we run it every night when GitLab is quiet. And uh, for since Gromox is very portable code, or we try to be, we also want to do some tests on Windows and Mac OS. And for that, we use uh, GitHub runners. It is separate and it's not properly integrated in our GitLab but it still runs the tests on every successful merge into main or release branch. And again, it, it is post-merge, but at least it allows us to quickly find which merge request broke things and not have it explode half a year later. And some things are not covered by our automation. We don't currently have any automated performance tests, so that is unfortunately uh, done manually. We are exploring different options to do that in collaboration with uh, compute centers, but it is not here yet. Uh, some analysis tools are also not tested of legacy tools before we started to be very strict about testing. Yeah, we had these tools written and contributed to Gromax, but then yeah, we had nobody willing to put enough effort to and tests like a few years later after they got merged. We don't have any large scale runs. We don't have, in CI we don't run on like whatever, 10 nodes and uh, 40 GPUs. Yeah, we only run single node with up to two GPU and up to four MPI ranks. So if, because if, if something breaks on that scaling, yeah, we won't catch it automatically, but that's about, just managing limited resources. We don't have particularly rare hardware. We don't have uh, IBM power architecture. We don't have Linux on ARM. We have Mac OS on ARM though. Uh, we don't have, have, for example, any like experimental GPUs or whatever, MI250s, uh, like we have in Lumi, we don't have them in CI. Uh, we also don't have uh, long-running physical validation tests, like long-running 
energy conservation things that, that's still being run manually every once in a while. Uh, and as uh, Mark said before, we have two different uh, frameworks for testing. We have Google tests that is modern and nice, and we try to use it everywhere nowadays. And that's what we call unit tests in Gromax. Well, they're not always unit tests by conventional definition. Sometimes it's integration tests, let's say. And we still have uh, some, it's called regression tests. This is run using old uh, scripts uh, that even separate repository and that are quite helpful, but we plan to slowly move them to use the Google test framework, uh, both because it is uh, somewhat more effective from the point of view of just like hardware utilization. You can more easily configure what, what things to run, what not to run. And also it's just easier for developers because you just have a single way to do things. And if, if you want to change, change something wrong, you don't have to learn two different frameworks. Luckily for you, probably you won't ever need to touch these Perl scripts. So it's just for you to know that there is this thing, but unless you are changing something significant in how simulation is run or fixing some uh, old bug that broke things in a major way, you won't have to deal with them other than see them pass just fine. Uh, and uh, there is a question, I think. Yes. Julian, Julian? yes, there is a question. I just give him a moment that I allowed Julian to mm -hmm. speak. You should be able to speak, Julian. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, so you say uh, we don't have to touch the regression tests unless we want to change MD run behavior. Um, mm -hmm. If we use this I simulator um, functionality, then we can actually change MD run behavior, but somehow separate from the core MD run, as, as I understand. Would that be breaking the regression tests? How do the regression tests mm -hmm. um, sort of cover this I simulator? So if you're adding a new functionality, say new neural force field or something, I mean, it, it there are no tests for it. So if it's new functionality, you won't break anything old. So that's fine. Is that what you were asking? Yes. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's not, yeah, it's, a, it's changing as in, cha it worked in some way before and now it works in a different way. Not that you're adding new functionality. I mean, adding is technically also changing, but I mean, here it's specific that you, ch you change uh, the output of MT run from how it was before. And yeah, we are not talking about it refused to to do things in more like uh, productive behavior. Yes, so running tests. While we have CI to run the tests for you, and sometimes if it's a very small and seemingly trivial fix, people are lazy and don't run tests, but generally before pushing the code, you should do reasonable checks that at least on your machine, it works fine. And classical way to do it is either do make tests and make check, or alternatively, instead of make check, you can use C make C test command to just run all the tests. If you want to rerun all, a single test, you can either call it directly, or you can uh, use again C test to run the single specific test case. A big advantage of this approach is that sometimes uh, tests have a specific value of NTOMP, number of OpenMP threads, or number of MPR ranks configured for them. And if you run it like this with ctest minus R, you will get this, this test run in exactly the same way as when you run make check. If you run it like this, 
it will use uh, always, for example, one rank. So it does matter for this specific MDRUN IO test, but for some other MDRUN tests, the behavior could be different depending on number of ranks. So here you use the default behavior as configured. Uh, for make check, here you use the uh, one rank, one thread behavior. You can all narrow it down even further. You can use gtest filter common to run only a small subset of tests. And again, you can try to play around. If, for example, you suspect that this test fails on two ranks, but not on one, yeah, you can try it out. Hopefully you won't encounter such bugs, but it can happen. And for example, if you have a test that fails only once in a while, but you still want to automatically test your fix for this bug, you have this nice feature of C test, I repeat until failure, that it will run this test 100 times or until it fails. So if you know that you have this test set fail sometimes, but not always because some undefined memory access somewhere, somewhere, and you contribute a fix, you can just run it like this and yeah, say, okay, it passed 100 times. So I am reasonably sure that even though the failure is random, it should be fixed. Now, where the tests live in the code base? Tests are grouped by the, usually by file, if you're talking about unit tests. So if you have some functionality in logger CPP, the tests for it live in tests logger CPP. Some tests use reference data, which live in tests ref data directory. Uh, we also have integration test style uh, test sets in SRC programs tests directly. Here we test the whole like, MD run behavior. And if you open one of the test files, usually you have a bunch of stanzas like this. Of course, with a bunch of includes on top. And here it's quite basic tests, test uh, group name, name for the specific test. Then we do something, we create an, an energy term, we add two frames. And then here we have expect EQ, expect that these two values are equal. Number frames is equal to two. And since it is expect, we check this if it is uh, these two values are not equal. The test fails, but other checks are still run. We still go here. We, we mark this test is failed, but we still go to see uh, further to see if there are any other errors. We get the error estimate, and then we do assert true. Something has value. Unlike expect, assert means that if this fails, we stop the test. We don't go further. So if error estimate doesn't have value. We won't go downstairs. Yeah, test failed, full stop. If a cert is fine, everything's fine. We go here. Here is custom macro checks the two real values, floating point values for equality. Comparing floating point values for equality is a bit tricky because of how the values are represented in computer memory. So we have the comparing uh, comparison with some toler default tolerance here. You can config, conf uh, use expect real EQ toll macro to compare with custom tolerance. But here we check that these two values are approximately equal. If they are, fantastic, test passes. If not, again, test is failed. And uh, you can, of course, read more about that. Uh, besides normal uh, basic tests like this, there are also parameterized tests. When you want to run same same test, for example, for a bunch of different parameters, you can use test p macro like this, and then use get param call, which returns a tuple, if you're familiar with C++, that you can then split into its components using std get. You get first and second component of the tuple. 
and then run the test with these two values. And then at the end of the test file, you say instantiate the suit P, and you check all the possible combination of names and the uh, or integers four, five, six, seven. So this builds all possible combinations with name four, name five, name one, four, name one, five, name one, six, name one, seven, name two, four, name two, five, name two, six, name two, seven. And for each combination, this test is run. Name goes here, value goes here, and then you should have some checks that actually test the behavior. It's quite, it's quite easy to have combinatorial explosion here and end up with a few hundred. Test cases, if they are fast, that's not a problem. If they're slow, yeah, probably you need to rethink which combinations you're testing. And it can, can get much more complicated uh, than I'm showing here. Is more documentation in Google Tests uh, web page, and also you have a related uh, good first issue on some refactoring such pieces of code among the issues such as it's for this workshop. Also, reference data I mentioned where it lives, and here is how to use it. For that, you use uh, test f macro. And you use the checker utility function. And basically, here we have, for example, a function do things that return a vector of strings. And here we check that this vector from begin to end is the same as the vector that's stored in the reference file under the label wrapped. And here is the where the reference file lives, it's wrap data, wrapper test wraps correctly. And the test data is in XML, and nobody likes, OK, most people don't like XML. And writing it by hand is very painful, and nobody wants to do that. That's why we have this uh, flag that can be passed to the test binary to automatically update or generate, if they are missing, the files with reference data according to the current behavior. So if you are adding test and you want to cre create a reference data for it to use, you can just run the test and will record the current behavior into the XML file. Then obviously you ideally should open the XML and inspect that it actually contains the correct reference values because you probably don't want to just like, test that the behavior of the code didn't change. You want to test that it is correct according to some definition. So don't just blindly uh, commit this file as it was automatically generated. But yeah, at least all the headers, all the current values will be there. And sometimes you don't want, uh, you don't only, you not only need to check the output, you also need some complicated input files. For example, you want to run test and analysis tool and you need some kind of trajectory as an input that you can test. And unless it is something exotic, for example, you're testing empty trajectories, uh, you can take one from our set of you know, simulation database living in SRC test utils, which where we have a bunch of PDB files, trajectory files, grow files, index files, all that stuff that you can, that are more or less typical more or less small and can easily be used in unit tests as a realistic input. And here is how you normally would use the code. You need to inherit from the command line test base helper class. And then yeah, you can create test F. You probably also need to check the number of output files if you have some complicated input. You create command line object and then you just call set input file minus s spc to grow like you would call the function and uh, it will find that there is a spc to grow file here in the image database and will pass the full path to it to the utility and then you call for example in this case gmx trj conf with this input and check that 
it returned zero. So the program at least uh, executed correctly. It didn't throw any errors. After that, you probably want to test that outputs are correct. Let's see previous slide or see some of the examples. In testing, we will test this very expensive framework. So sometimes I find it easier to just look at the examples. Uh, and that's actually what we will do now. So back to basics. You can see my screen, right? Yep. Yes, we can see it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And so again, that's very basic tests. We create a utility fixed capacity vector of integers of set three. We push back, we check that there is one value, we pop back, we check that there is no value, and also that it's empty. So that's like very basic checks. And here is just boilerplate, copyright, and a bunch of includes. And that's yeah. for simple tests like this, that's all there is to it. If uh, we are talking about more complex cases, yeah, if you want parameterize the tests, uh, here's how it realistically looks. You have this tuple params, you split into mass charge type value to state name, you do some internal gromics initialization using all these values. Yeah, you use mass, use charge, here it is. This particle is given properties and you use helper functional run test. And here's, yeah, instant chain test suite. So you use build data, simulation particle test, and all the tests with this label, you have a bunch of them, will be run with all the possible combinations of mass, charge, type, and uh, what was the last one, and use to state name. For all possible combinations, three times three times three times two, things will be, this test will be run. And here is how you use reference data. Again, you just test F, macro, and here you call, in this case, check text or checker check sequence to check against the XML. And here is the XML file text line wrapper test wraps correctly, which is, yeah, as readable as XML typically goes, but here you have, yeah wrapped at 10 of this text, a quick brown fox jumps over the list doc, we wrap it to 10 lines, 10 characters per line. And here's how the output should look like. And we check that the output of the program matches this save data, similarly wrapped to vector, we should get five vector uh, of length five and following values. And uh, yeah, gets it all together. Here's how you run the whole, it's more integration tests you, you create. Uh, you again have parameterized tests that is run for actually only one value of first parameter. So yeah, not really parameterized here, but three different values of the second parameter. And yeah, we create, we get these parameters as a tuple of two strings. We create common line, uh, get the common line as a string here. We get the base name as the first parameter, common line, very common line object. Create matcher to check the output file. In this case, XVG set the tolerance to check for floating point values because it's rarely exactly the same. We have set trajectory here that is basically just called set input file minus F, set topology, similarly, set input file minus T. So we use the base name, this TRP cage, uh, XTC and TRP cage TPR as inputs. We add an option, we set output file, set tolerance and run test, and run tests in terms, runs the uh, command, checks that the comment is correct. 
and uh, goes through the data set and checks the output. Uh, it is a lot of boilerplate. It's hard to understand. In most cases, you more follow the examples of all the documentation. You probably don't need to fully understand how these uh, all abstraction layer works. And since it's parameterized test with uh, several, sorry, here, uh, several possible values, but also with uh, uh, input and uh, with output parameters, you can you can see that uh, there are three different XMLs. There are option ways to set uh, nice things, but by default, multiple reference files are just numbered. So mass charge geometry, three different sets of parameters, three different reference values, and here's. The output looks like again XML. You have command line tested here that's built correctly, and we have all the values that we check that they are approximately equal. Now that's again that was a lot and dense, but it is for you not as much as uh, not that I hope that you will understand every bit of code that I showed, but more or less that you get a feeling of where to find things and in general how things are organized. So when you get to write your own tests, uh, you know how to approach it. And yeah, if you're fixing a bug, writing a test could be a reasonably good first step because it both allows you to reproduce the bug it allows you to easily test that you fixed it and to show others that you fixed it. And also, if something was broken once, chances are it's not trivial and it will be broken later. So it's good to have these tests there for posterity. And if you are adding a new code, again, it's good to think how it will be tested, how to split into easily testable units. Again, it's both for your sake as a developer, so you can have easier time with testing and debugging it. It's for the sake of reviewers, so they can quickly see through tests what your function does. That's also a form of a documentation in a way. They clearly show the intent behavior of your code and also makes your code more robust. So later during the factoring or some unusual architecture, the code doesn't silently break. And also we have to accept that, as I mentioned, we have a lot of things test manually in Gromax. And that's not because manual testing is so great. It's because sometimes Russian automatic tests can be quite hard. So yeah, sometimes it's good to just use your judgment and say, yeah, it will be like two weeks work to write a proper test for this one line fix. So yeah, sorry, not doing that. That is also a valid approach. Let's be uh, practical here. And yeah, for further information, you can look at Gromox developer manual. In particular, we have a whole page dedicated to reference data and also Google test has a nice introductory uh, documentation here, getting started guide. So that is about it on the documentation. Do we have any questions? Um, currently, thank you, Andre. Uh, mm -hmm. So currently, we have no question, not a raise and and not question in the Q and A, but maybe they will come. So mm -hmm. I hope that people, yeah, because you cover a lot of things. And there are a lot of information. So yeah. please go ahead with questions. Yeah. And uh, yeah. It you can ask questions also later through uh, yeah, you Slack can... or chat. Yeah, so what I forgot yesterday to say was Gromax has uh, also a, a Slack channel. So you can always uh, ask question also on the Slack channel. I can put, uh, I can put mm -hmm. the invitation in, uh, I can, uh, I can create an invitation link so uh, I can put in Slack. So uh, sorry, in the chat, in the chat. So you can, you can, if you want, in the future, you can yeah. use the chat channel. And as yes. I was say yesterday, 
we have also we have, yeah we have this general yeah channel here yeah exactly it's not very lively but you can totally come anytime and ask questions about development yeah and then you can also ask question in the future like i was mm -hmm. saying yesterday on the forum okay, i have some just in the chat. things yeah and uh, and then uh, uh, sorry Nothing. I, I just saw that there was some message in the chat, but I was I was uh, putting was yeah, I was you. It was me putting information in the chat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then uh, uh, so you know that you can use the QA button, not the chat to ask questions because uh, for the mm -hmm. the chat is disabilitated for uh, for the people. And um, so uh, what other things? So I also, in the meantime, I want to, sh I will share with you also the presentation of uh, yesterday of Mark. Just give me a moment. But in the meantime, if you want to raise your hand and ask question, please go ahead. I have also that one in under control. So, but as, uh... and maybe I reshare the presentation of Andre for those that, uh, are a little were joined a little late, so now I have, we have uh, Chris that has mm -hmm. a question. I put in the in the oh sorry this is wrong. I just uh, just one moment, uh, Chris. I will give you the word. I allowed you to speak, Chris. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I was looking like at, during your presentation, I'm pulling up the code right here on uh, my laptop and I'm looking at the ref data folder that you called out with all the XML files. Um, mm -hmm. At least the way I'm looking at it right now, I don't see much that has to do with like the numerical testing of the different, uh, like the unit tests, right? Uh, but I don't know if I'm looking in the wrong place. It's, this seems like a lot of like text-based and logging-based kind of uh, stuff. So where is- I mean, if you're looking at the, uh, if, at which one you're looking, because just like tests are split per module, uh, the ref reference data is also split per module. So we have- Oh, okay. So trajectory analysis test ref data is reference data for trajectory analysis module. If you're looking at utility, yeah, perhaps, it is mainly yeah uh yeah it's mostly logging other things but that is utility if you go to programs test and run tests, ref data, here you have kinetic energy here, yeah, okay, boring one, engine minimization, something. That is uh, integration tests leaving here. And the test files are one directory over here. Thank you, Andre. Do you have any other uh, question or uh, for Andre? Or if you want also question for the lecture of yesterday, or we have a question again, Chris, no? Disappear, I guess uh, it was a mistake. Oh yes, Chris again. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Sorry, I, I was muted partway through that. Uh, <laughs> I had some, some follow-up. Uh, so thank you for that. I have now found uh, the relevant mm -hmm. XML files uh, for the tests that I'm interested in. So it looks like the values in this XML are like the, the value that we're targeting 
for example, from a particular unit test and, and the one that I'm looking at, which is the entropy tests, the target values are hard coded in like, oh, this is the value that you should get, quote. Um, so we need to have our own yeah, validation test cases ready to generate these these numbers, for example. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have an interesting case where I had a bug that had numerical errors. Um, mm -hmm. I fixed the numerical errors, and now when I just run Gromax, it looks like I'm getting the right result, but now it fails the test because perhaps the test was designed with the previous uh, mm -hmm. algorithm that had the error. So now I need to find a way to <laughs> validate uh, if the old test was right or if the old code was right. Do you know what I mean? Uh, what's the, when you end up yes. in a question like that, where both things, like there was a mm -hmm. misalignment, but the test was saying mm -hmm. that the bug was correct. How do I go about fixing the whole validation of the, the problem? Yes. Uh, yes. So from purely technical things, that's how you change the thing in the reference data, but obviously how do you Okay, for some reasons, the lights went out. Uh, that's how you cause the XML to be updated, but how do you prove that the value is correct? That is a really broad question with no definite answer. Sometimes you might uh, just say that in your case, okay, this formula was definitely wrong. The old result was produced using formulas. It's wrong because in this paper, in this book, the that's like factor one over two and the code used factor one over three, for example. So you can just use convincing people. Uh, alternatively, you can add another check uh, for some uh, other quantity. For example, the square, square sum of squares of some values should be always one. And uh, yeah, and if all reference data was wrong, you change the reference data and you also add this new check that also this condition should be satisfied because physics. So I'm not uh, very much uh, on top of your specific issue with this uh, thermodynamic quantities, but yeah, that is, that is also definitely one thing to prove that your results. For example, if you have uh, a trajectory with uh, velocities of uh, NVE ensemble, perhaps you can, in addition to updating velocities, check that coordinates and they check that energy is actually conserved. But, yeah, that's, that very much depends on the yeah. issue. Thank you, Andre. It's fine, Chris. Can I, can, sorry, can I can I add here? So this is a a difficult question, I'd say, because mm -hmm. if you have a com complicated thing to compute, then it's difficult to say what the right answer is. So we have this issue quite regularly. I mean, if we look at either math or or some results some algorithm produces, I mean, it's a, it might be challenging to find the right thing. So. One way is coming up with a simpler a simpler method that computes the same thing. I mean, we now had a a nasty bug, which in the end didn't ha seem to have much effect, but some pairs in the pair is missing. So how to check that? I mean, I think the only way in the end is make a simpler, a trivial algorithm that computes a pair list, so you have a reference to compute or to, co to compare against. So, yeah. But that's a challenging, can be quite challenging. So there's no simple answer to that, apart from consistency checks as 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 Andre mentioned, which you of course would do if you can find some. Chris, that's an, this answer to your question? Uh yeah, for the well, I guess it answers my question in terms of is there a broadly accepted practice or whatever? Um, but yeah, it seems like the, the answer is satisfying, but also is challenging where I need to find some kind of like, in, in my case, 
uh, for the bug that I'm working on. I need some validation case, maybe like a really simple case, uh, because this is like using what I'm dealing with is using a, an estimation method for calculating entropy, which, you know, like you can't just sit down and do by hand. It's not like a harmonic <laughs> oscillator or something. Uh, so like I need to figure out how I'm trying to think of a creative way to validate my new entropy numbers so that I can update the test scripts checking. Uh, so anyways, uh, I will I will mull this over a little bit slash talk with you guys a little further uh, today about this, I think. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Is there any other? I will mute you. Is there any other people that will question? Some other someone else that has a question for Andre concerning the presentation of today? or maybe for Mark for the presentation or in general for the topic of today and the topic of yesterday, please go ahead. We have time. I see that it's very quiet. Uh, okay, so, the, so I post in the chat uh, the presentation of today. I reposted the presentation today. I post a link for the presentation of yesterday. I post also the invitation for the Slack channel where quick question can be discussed on Chromax development. And I post also the link to the forum where we have a category de dedicated to the Chromax development and where there are also the announcement that was mentioned by Mark yesterday every two weeks on Wednesday at five o'clock there is we, everybody can join to ask questions and we discuss uh, what is going on and uh, other aspects of Gromax development. And then you are welcome also to join there with also whatever question. And, um, and then I want to remember that tomorrow we will have also the round table. Some, yesterday, some questions have been coming up that we will address in the round table. I will update, in a, update everything in a live document. So, uh, so then know that I will share also tomorrow. So you can, if you think about some question that you want to address in the round table, please put it there. And so we will start at 145 with everything about coding from Berk. And then follow, this is a, yeah, it's less technical lecture. So then we will have Q&A or discussion, I will call. Then we have a break. And then we have uh, this round table. And then we close at... Uh, uh, for 30 uh, Central European time. Uh, okay, I try to make some, I see that no question coming up, so I hope that everything is clear. Well done, Andre. And uh, yeah, and uh, so then I will close this uh, session. Oh, we have Pattern that has a question. Okay, I allowed Pattern to speak. Please, Pattern, go on. Yeah, sorry if there's a, an echo. Um, hopefully it's not going to be too bad. Um, I was just it's wondering. Right. So yesterday I got a merge, or I pushed a merge uh, request. I got some comments back. So I was just wondering if I want to proceed um, with this request and add some additional comments. What's the actual merge strategy? Um, since I'll be, I should be rebasing somehow onto main, right? Again with the updated code. But I was wondering if I'm supposed to rebase my entire branch and repush it or um, just merge mm -hmm. from from main and then start to work on that or what is the actual strategy here that you would use? So uh, we use uh, squash, and mer squash and merge strategy. So GitLab automatically will squash all the Unless you change the defaults, Git, uh, GitLab will squash all your commits into one, set the description and title according to your MR settings, rebase it on top of main and merge. So if everything is fine, if you don't run into any conflicts, you just click rebase and then merge in GitLab and it will do things automatically. So for example, you can just uh, 
uh, rebase the branch through GitLab and uh, yeah, it will do. You don't usually need to do it frequently again, unless you expect that there are some changes that are non-trivial and might conflict with yours. So usually it's, you just do it right before the merge. Uh, if you expect that there are some, you can both merge main into your branch or rebase and force push into your branch that are two strategies different people use. I, I personally prefer rebase, but some people do use merge and they both work usually okay. Okay, thank you, Andre. I can, I can add here that, I mean, I don't know what your question exactly was, Petra. So if, if you get review comments, our general recommendation is to fix those in one or more separate commits and push those up on top of what you have. So don't change anything else. So it's clear what changes you made in in, re, in reply to the comments and don't combine that with with rebasing or squashing or whatever so people right. can see the old version also working. sorry just continue working on the same on the same branch and push those changes yes yes exactly so then uh, then we see then we see the history and then people can see what you actually changed in that commit uh, in reply to a thing mm -hmm. it will be squashed at the end anyhow so um yeah yeah, yeah, one reason we don't usually rebase during development is because it's quite hard to see what, what got changed. And GitLab has some functionality to handle this. For example, if you merge from main or rebase on top of main, GitLab tries to be smart and only show your changes between two different pushes, but it often also fails to do it correctly. So yeah, unless you need to rebase or merge, you prefer not to do that. Okay, so we'll deal with the mess once <laughs> once it's actually done then, ready to be merged. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Ho hopefully there won't be any mess. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Peter. We had a question from Lucas. No, yeah, we have also one question in the Q and A. Shall mm -hmm. I take the one in the Q and A and then I will unmute. Uh, I will unmute Lucas. The Q and A. We have a question. Uh, may you drop small test? to check and run and run as demo for practical purpose? Mm, could you elaborate? What do you mean for demo or practical purpose? I, I don't put any sense uh, here. Tataya, can you mm -hmm. re-elaborate or shall I, shall I unmute you? What you prefer this type? Oh, he will speak. Okay, I allowed him to speak or her. Yeah, please, you can speak now. Yes, uh, ma'am. Uh, since I am new for this uh, Gromex, but I have experience in programming and so on. I, I have been teaching also. So what we do when we uh, teach something or let anybody learn something, then we just give some demo problems. Just do and test how it works and so on. So yesterday also I requested that if uh, you summarize all the instructions in a PDF file, uh, a video of 10, 15 minutes in which uh, the demo is given so that uh, we can easily follow and uh, may practice also some of the tests. Is it clear, sir? Uh, uh, so wait, you want, yeah. I think he's speaking uh, I mean, uh, in general I mean, of demo. I mean, I mean to say yes. that you just make some changes, uh, make a video of that, and uh, what kind of uh, things are appearing on the interface so that whether it is correct or accepted. Uh, so that thing will be easier for the new ones. Right? Uh, we haven't planned to record any like video tutorials, as far as I know. Uh, plus, yeah, it, yeah. I mean, I I have shown some snippets, so you can probably look at these examples uh, if 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 you need. Yeah, the, the slides uh, have the file names, and you will have access to the recording of the lecture just to see how the things are organized. But yeah, we are, we are not planning to record any demos. So, uh, PDF version of this is your lecture will also be available. And so uh, we can watch and then uh, repeat and watch it. 
Yeah, sure. And also the video will be available. So you oh. can rewatch the video and also the presentation. Right, thank you. Sorry. And uh, so that those material will come at the end. I'm wrapping all the material and we are post-processing the video in a way that we will have then a full package at the end with uh, both PDF file and video for all the story, also the live document that we are building mm -hmm. on top. I hope that this will be useful. But of course, if you have other suggestions how we could do a demo, you can just mail uh, and then we we maybe we are always open to new idea. That is, uh, they are most welcome. Thank you very much. And now I will mute you, Sadaya. And I will unmute uh, uh, Luca. Lucas. Please, Luca, go ahead. Uh, yeah, you should be able to hear me now, right? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, I would have otherwise asked this question maybe internally, but I thought it might be also interesting for someone else. So I am currently running into uh, the question of how to like merge my changes, basically. And because it's a new feature, it's gotten quite extensive, I would say. So it's a, quite a large MR. Um, and I think the best practice here would be to actually split it into multiple MRs, mm -hmm. heard, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that is uh, definitely correct. It is easier to review because yeah, if it's 10,000 lines change, who, who, who can review that? And it's also okay, easier to just reason about and later, if we know something is broken, we can easily narrow it in to this small piece of code. Exactly. So I, I, but I was kind of unsure, uh, kind of how to go about that. If you would prefer to have changes uh, split into MRs, kind of uh, chronologically, as they were mm -hmm. added to the branch, or because I've been, uh, you know, making changes in multiple files and like mm -hmm. redoing things, uh, it might be better to uh, actually split them into like functional units that kind of can stand on their own and then kind of let them depend on each other like what what's the preferred approach here uh so preferred approach is split is splitting into self-sufficient self-contained bits so this uh, looking at each separate mr we can say what exactly it does it's not that you just split uh, uh ten thousand uh, well, if it, if your MR changes 36 files, you don't just split it into 36 MRs by file. The, the purpose of splitting is that you can think and reason and review uh, and handle on its own each uh, individual change. So yeah, it, it, it is a very vague answer, unfortunately. But yeah, the, the purpose is that uh, each change can be viewed more or less on its own. And yes, yeah, sometimes it is indeed hard to get it sufficiently small. So yes, yeah, sometimes you have to deal with huge MRs because yeah, if, if you had a huge uh, chunk of, if you had say new implementations of uh, non-bonded kernels for a new GPU backend, you can probably extract some utilities, but still you have this huge kernel function and it needs to go in one chunk because it doesn't make any sense to commit a path. Mm -hmm. So it, it should be self-contained, self-sufficient chunks that basically the, I think it, it's helpful to, uh, to think in terms of this MR does that. This MR adds this callback to MD modules. This MR adds uh, CMake to detect PyTorch. And this MR adds, uh, given the CMake functionality there and uh, all the necessary callbacks here, this MR adds support to call PyTorch this in basic form. And then this MR adds whatever, also the ability to use, to, to pass velocities, or maybe not. If it's artificial split, again, it's it doesn't help if the split is artificial just for the purpose of Splitting in a way. If I may add, yeah. if a splitting, 
Yeah, so if I just may add a comment regarding the chronology, it might make sense in a way that you keep your own development branch so that you can keep your commit history and go back if there is anything that has that you wonder about why you did a certain change or need to revert something. But when pushing up to as an MR, it's good to use the latest version of your code. Right. So then I would I would go and probably uh, create actually a new branch and kind of cherry pick the different parts of the code uh, as kind of functional mm -hmm. blocks and then uh, merge them. Yeah, that's yeah, what you I can would also find. push. Uh, yeah. You can also push the whole change as a draft MR to GitLab and just ask, like, yeah, so here is a huge chunk of code. How specifically? Hi all. I have this ten thousand lines change. How best to split it? And we'll try to probably point some things there. That's also very strategy if you feel yourself stuck and don't know how to split it further. Okay, I'll do my best. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Andre. And uh, so, do we have? Uh... Any other question? I don't see it. In that case, uh, we can just uh, close the session. I thank you again a lot, Andre. And then we gather back for the lecture tomorrow. That is Thursday, 12 September at 1.45 Central European time with the lecture, everything around coding from Verkes. Thank you. And uh, for the one that are at the end of the day, have a good finish of the day for the other, have a good continuation of the day. Bye-bye.